The following sermon was recorded at Tri-State Worship Center at The Point. Tri-State Worship Center is a church of God founded in Southern Ohio, where we encourage the saints, help the hurting, and embrace all people. Watch, listen, and allow Pastor Terry Wagner to help you find your path to enlightenment. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning, say, yep. 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 We're glad you're here. I'm honored that you came to spend some time with us. We have a special speaker this morning, not a special guest, because she's part of the family, been here since the beginning of this church. And I uh, got the honor and the privilege of listening to this uh, message once already, and I think I need to hear it again to find out what kind of mother I'm supposed to be. <laughs> she says, this is for all of us. I did notice in the first service how there was some typecasting that went on, not just because Deborah was played by Deborah, but you know, even the Jezebel. I shouldn't give it all away, should I? I shouldn't give it all. But I do want to say one thing, Sabrina, before you go, you must be the most praying person I know because every time they tried to stick one of those bad things on you, it went right off. Hallelujah. That'll make sense in just a minute. Kim, come and take your liberty. Do you love Kim Workman and her family this morning? Good morning. Um, just want to say Happy Mother's Day to all our lovely mothers out there. Um, I said this morning I had a really deep gratitude and appreciation for Pastor Terry because this is so not easy. Um, I'm a little bit of an odd duck, oddball, whatever. I don't uh, conform to time restraints real well. And so this is going to be very, very quick or this is going to be very, very long. <laughs> and uh, just... If you'll uh, bear with me, I'll try to get somewhere in the middle. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with prayer, so if you guys will just join me, I just want to open with prayer. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for this opportunity that you've given me. I appreciate you so much for placing the, the trust within me to be a mother and, and to the many mothers that are here. Lord, I just pray that you would use these simple words that I have that lack everything accept your power and your grace as you apply it. I pray, Lord, that you would open our ears and open our hearts, and I pray, God, that most of all, you would just step in and take over the service and have your way. In your name I pray and I trust. Amen. 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 So, May is the time uh, when we start to recognize change, and things begin to awaken, uh, things burst forth, flowers are in bloom, babies are in abundance, and all of nature seems to be just filled with life. And we celebrate our mothers, um, those who have experienced birth, those who have carried a child for a moment or for months. Um, mothers who by any means have cared for or nurtured a child um, that are around them, aunts, sisters, friends, whoever you are. Um, as women, we usually take on that role to whatever child's around us. Um, but I feel like we kind of missed the mark on celebrating Mother's Day. And this day, I don't feel it's exclusive to the childbearing woman and maybe not even to just women. So you'll have to go with me a little bit. Um, motherhood is the makeup of our Father in Heaven. And so because we are created in His image and His likeness, we all, men and women, are made to create. We are um, made to labor, to birth to God, whatever seed he places in us. So this morning, I want to look at our spiritual motherhood. But first, we have to ask ourselves two questions. One, am I really a mother? And two, what am I carrying? The first answer is yes, absolutely yes, you are a mother. You carry the seed of truth, the message of Christ is inside you. John 1, 1 through 4 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and through Him all things were made, all things. Without Him nothing was made, and in Him was life, and that life was the light of men. Each of us carry the life-saving, life-giving knowledge of Christ, who He is, what He's done, and what He will do. So, now that we know that we are all mothers, we've got to ask what we're carrying. <coughs> And we are all carrying a very holy thing. It is the very purpose of God in our lives, and it is to bring Him glory. So how do we bring God glory? First, we make disciples. 
Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, that wherever you go, make disciples of all nations. Teach them to do everything I have commanded you. He says, wherever you go, whether you're at home, you're at school, you're at work, you're at the park, wherever you are, we are to be making disciples for him. And secondly, everything that we do should be credited to God. We need to be, as 1 Peter 4, 7, 11 tells us, it gives us a, a little play-by-play uh, -play of how we're supposed to do this. It says we're to be clear-minded and self-controlled so that we can pray. It says to be above um, all things, we need to love each other because it covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality without grumbling. Use your gift to serve others. Faithfully administer God's grace in its various forms. If you speak, do it as one speaking the very words of God. And if you serve, do it with the strength that God provides. So that in all things, God may be praised through this. So now that we know we're mothers, and we are carrying a holy thing, let's take a look back and see just how important this motherhood is. We're going to call this, What's in Your Womb? We're going to use the center aisle, so um, if you'll just give us the center aisle. <clears throat> Our first mother is Rebecca. Rebecca is the mother of wavering faith. She is chaste, courteous, helpful, industrious. She is trusting, kind, courageous, and she's decisive. She is married to Isaac, and their life together must have been peaceful, for they are the first recorded monogamous marriage. She's 20 years barren, and not only is she religious, she has an intimate relationship with God. Now, Rebecca becomes pregnant with twins, and the babies begin to wrestle each other in the womb. And this concerns Rebecca. In Genesis 25, we see where Rebecca goes to God, and she says, I'm concerned, I don't know what's going on. And he replies, and he says, listen, you're going to birth two nations, and they will be separate, but the elder will serve the younger. Now, God tells her his plan, but he does not tell her how it will come to pass. She loved her children, and she pondered their destinies. And when it seemed that God's plan would not come to pass, she became overwhelmed by her fear. And she forgot God's abilities. She acted quick, and she deceived her husband so that she could ensure God's promise would be fulfilled. Now, she probably felt justified in her actions because, after all, she was getting the Lord's end result. But her deception and her lack of faith come at a huge price. She taught her sons both deception and she birthed a murderous rage in the eldest. She reaped the loss of her youngest son because she would have to send him away for his own safety. She would never see her son again. She reaped the contempt of her eldest because he would always know his mother's betrayal and her deeper love for, her, for his younger brother. Her husband would lack confidence and trust in her. And she would see a return to the polygamous marriage by both of her sons. See, Rebecca had every good thing to pass to her children. But out of her womb came regret, sorrow, pain, loss, deception, contempt, brokenness, separation from God, selfishness, and revenge. Our next mother is Miram, and she is the mother of worship. She is courageous, fearless, confident, poised. She is intelligent, she is commanding, and above all, she is joyful. Now, she is single, and she is the sister of Moses and Aaron. She has no children, yet her womb is completely full. See, she secures the protection of her baby brother Moses, and she plays a vital, important part in seeing that his life continues at a time when the law was demanding his death. She is a life giver. She was revered and honored as the sister of Moses and Aaron, and she became a prophetess during Israel's deliverance. She led the woman across the seabed by simply rejoicing and worship to God. Exodus 15 and 20 says, Then Miriam the prophet took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing unto the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Now she is the first recorded female singer. And by simply using her talent, singing and worship to God, she deepens her faith and her confidence in him. 
She fulfills an important role in her people. She is their worship leader. Time passes and she has a spiritual backstep. She is jealous. She is bitter and envious. Perhaps due to feeling maybe second to her brothers, or whatever her reason, she begins to complain and she does this publicly. Now she is a woman of great influence and because her because she is has this uh, influence, her complaining has the power to break down the authority of Moses and to diminish the hope of her people. Envy spreads over her character and she gets leprosy and this is a disease that is both infectious and painful and she's shut out of her camp. But she has such a great effect on her people and they love her so much that they refuse to journey on towards the promised land until she is whole. Well, Moses prays for her healing and she is healed. And she's touched and broken by her brother's love. So she repents for her envy and both her mind and her body are now healed. And forgiven and in right standing with the Lord, Miriam resumes her place and she continues her purpose, that of worship. When Miriam passes, her funeral is observed for 30 days and her legacy of worship for God's love and provision, his freedom and deliverance live on. She never saw the promised land, but she continued to walk in faith. And out of her womb came repentance, faith, worship, surrender, confidence, purpose, and the power of deliverance. Our next mother is Deborah. Deborah is the mother of faith in action. She is dignified, she is authoritative and humble. She is a counselor, a judge, and a deliverer. She is fearless, faithful, and she is in tune with God. Now she has many roles, first as a homemaker, and then a counselor to her people, and next as a judge in their disputes, and, their, and finally as a deliverer in the time of war. She was a mother to Israel, she rose to great leadership simply by the consent of her people. She had such a deep trust in God, and she had the ability to inspire that in others. Now, her people were oppressed, and many had turned to idol worship during these 20 years. And the men, they stand in fear. They cannot see their own abilities and the ability of God. All they can see is the ability of their enemy. Well, while they pale with fear, Deborah burns with indignation. And she feels a call to rise up against fear and complacency. And she carries a great hope for God's rescue if her people will just simply turn and honor him again. Now, Deborah is a homemaker. She was not a warrior. But through her counsel, she sensed their fears and she kindled in them an enthusiasm to rise up and take action. She summons one of Israel's most capable military men. And together they devise a plan. Deborah conveys to this military man that she does not have any fear that she trusts that the spirit is greater than any weapon or fortification and she trusts God to deliver the enemy into their hands go she tells him now this great military man says if you go I'll go but if not I'm not going and this is probably because he sensed the spiritual insight that Deborah had and he just wants her to accompany him Whatever the reason, her response in Judges 4 and 9 moves her from deliverer leader to a prophet. She says, I'll go, but you'll not receive the honor. The Lord will deliver the enemy into the hands of a woman. And he did. Now see, Deborah was a woman of action. She did not wait around for the approval of others or even their assistance. But armed with the strength of God, she went. She took zero credit for the victory. She led her panicky children through chaos, and she comforted them and empowered them with her faith and her obedience. Her devotion to God and her surrender to be wholly used allowed her people to be victorious and free. And out of her womb came courage, direction, deep faith, surrender, awakenness, passion, Trust, honor, excellence, wisdom, deliverance, inspiration, comfort, and kindness. Our next mother has no name. <clears throat> she is simply known as Ichabod's mom. And she is the mother of despair. 
She is sad. She is sorrowful. She is hopeless. She's negative and depressed, weak, unmotivated. She's unstable, and she is lacking in faith. Uh, Ichabod's mom had married the son of a priest. But he is a very immoral man, and he's full of greed. She herself is a religious woman, but she likes a true relationship with God. And she values the symbols of God more than God himself. Ichabod's mom becomes pregnant, and tragedy strikes. Her husband and brother-in-law are killed in battle. They were the guardians of the Ark of the Covenant, and because of their failure to protect it, it is now in the enemy's hands. Her father-in-law, upon hearing this news about his sons in the Ark of the Covenant, he falls and he breaks his neck. Now, Ichabod's mom realizes that her child is going to be born with this legacy. And she crumbles because she is without a true devotion to God and she has nothing to sustain her. Her grief and stress add to her powerlessness and they cause her to have premature labor. She is without hope for herself or her son. And soon after labor, she dies. She did not possess the faith or strength it took to rise above such overwhelming disappointment and tragedy. She lacked the courage to live and nurture her son. And had she put her hope in God and placed her faith in him, her legacy would surely be different. She named him Ichabod, and that means no glory. And he remained unknown throughout history. See, had she chose to really know God, her son may have been used to restore honor to both her and him. Because after all, he was the grandson of a priest. The Lord may have used him to rescue the Ark of the Covenant. And out of her womb, we see powerlessness, depression, spiritual blindness, faithlessness, darkness, abandonment, and death. Our next mother is Rizpa. And she is the mother of patience and unconditional love. She is loving and faithful. She is patient. She is fierce and courageous. She is devoted, long-suffering. She is resilient and she is strong. Narizpa is Saul's concubine and he is killed. And then she is given to his general Abner and he too is killed. Narizpa is alone, but she has two sons by Saul. There is a famine in the land. And King David concludes that this is due to Saul's sins never being made right. So he, King David, has Saul's sons and his grandsons hanged. Now, Rizpah is powerless to stop this. Even though she had no part in Saul's choices, she has to bear the consequences of them. Her sons are hanged, and for five months she grieves. She watches over their dishonored bodies to make sure no further harm will come to them. She fends off animals the looks of others, their mocking, and perhaps even their attempts to get her to stop. She had faith that God would deliver the land. Her sons would then have an honorable burial. And believing her sons hung there for the sins of others, she refused to forsake them even in death. What love, what devotion, what suffering. See, she's lost everything. She is the talk on everyone's lips. She is tired. She is alone but she is not without her faith. Her suffering reaches King David, and he gathers the bodies of her sons, of Saul, and his grandsons, and together they are buried in their family grave. They are now buried with honor. In the loss of everything, in her deepest sorrows, Rizba bears up under God's strength, and she pursues loyalty, acceptance, and love. And out of her womb, we see compassion, strength, respect, resilience, unconditional love, integrity, faith, devotion, endurance, confidence, hope, and a true servant's heart. <clears throat> Our next mother is Jezebel. She is the mother of opposition to God. She is corrupt and domineering. She is sinister. She's forceful and selfish. She's impatient. She is deceitful and heartless. She's influential. She's entitled. She's idolatrous. 
and above all, she is rebellious. Jezebel is the, is the daughter of the king of Tyre. She marries a king, she is the mother and grandmother of kings, but she is neither a good wife, mother, or ruler. She has a heritage of greed and murder and power, and she is also a worshiper of Baal, a cult that is sensual, cruel, and revolting. Now she brings with her this Baal worship, and she teaches and instills the customs into the Hebrew nation, even building temples for their worship. She has every opportunity to do good and embrace God. Listen to Psalms 45. Listen, daughter, look closely. Turn your ear towards me. Forget your people and forget your father's house. The king longs for your beauty. He is your Lord, worship him. The people of Tyre want to win your favor with a gift, but the daughter of the king is glorious inside the palace. Your sons will take the place of your father and you will make them princes over the whole earth. I will cause your name to be remembered throughout every generation. Well, instead, Jezebel persecutes prophets and she takes possession of whatever she wants. She overtook her husband's authority and she murdered those who opposed her and stood in her way. Elijah the prophet warns her that she will be devoured by dogs and that her entire house will be dishonored in death. But even this does not move Jezebel. She has no fear or reverence for God or his word. She is so confident in her own ability and power that she cannot recognize she is rooted in evil and completely powerless. God's word is always supreme and true. She was killed by her own servants, her body eaten by dogs, her children and her grandchildren were all killed tragically and without honor. And her name has been remembered through every generation. In our own dictionary, her name is a term for reproach. She herself is a synonym for wickedness. And out of her womb comes death, contempt, shamefulness, twisted desires, entitlement, greed, cruelty, aggression, terror, judgment, foolishness, idolatry, and punishment. next mothers. We have a duo. <laughs> this is Eunice and Lois. And they are the mothers of purpose and unity. They are faithful. They are believers. They're united and invested. Sowers, good stewards. They are industrious and they are loving. Eunice is Timothy's mother and there is no mention of his father because he's probably away due to battle or possibly even death. And Lois is Timothy's grandmother. Now together these women raise Timothy. Eunice probably has to work outside the home and she has to entrust Timothy's care to someone and who better than Lois, her own mother, who no doubt taught her to depend on God and have faith in all his ways. Now together they train him and they live an example of purpose, faith, and love before him. At age 15, the Apostle Paul takes <laughs> Timothy into his ministry and calls him a man of God. At 15, he is already a man of God before he ever goes with Paul. He was already knowledgeable of God and set apart for ministry. And Paul calls him his dearly beloved son and entrusts the preaching of the gospel to him. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15 probably gives the best memorial to Eunice and Lois. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. Continue in what you've learned and been convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Eunice and Lois train Timothy in temperament and actions, values, morals, his faith in Christ. They shaped his heart and mind. They grew his faith and wisdom. And they encouraged his growth and supported his efforts. They empowered him to be used of God. And they expected it. And so naturally, he did too. Through Timothy, we see their legacy. And out of their wounds came unselfishness, generosity, devotion, compassion, loyalty, 
gentleness, patience, expectation, fulfillment, and self-sacrifice for the cause of Christ. Thank you, ladies. So, we're going to look and see what this motherhood really has to do, the importance of it. And we're going to call this your spiritual what to expect when you're expecting. If you've had a baby, I'm sure you've probably read this book or given this book as a gift or, or something. It's the, the how-to and what if and oh no and oh my book that all mothers carry. So, what we've seen from the past we still see today. Various types of mothers trying, succeeding, failing, rebelling, pressing on, and sometimes even giving up. And the key to successful motherhood then was complete and total surrender to God. And the great thing about the Word of God is that what was true then is still true today. Our success is found in complete surrender to God and His will for our lives. So whether you've prayed for motherhood, or you plan for it, or you find yourself unexpectedly pregnant with the plans of God, you need to keep six truths in mind. First, it is yours because God placed it within you. God does not make mistakes. His plans are perfect, and they do not require our approval or our understanding. No matter what your friends think, or how deserving or, or undeserving you feel, or if you think it's your time, or someone thinks it's not your time, whatever opinion presents itself is of little importance, because God's plan is for you, and if it is for you, that is enough. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Next, it is yours to nurture and grow, to ponder and plan. It is yours to pray over. In Jeremiah 1, 5, he says that before, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. God's plan within us needs loved on. We need to take time to know it inside and out. The more we feed it and allow it to grow within us, the stronger it becomes. And we will grow along with it and become accustomed to its presence. And we need to pray over it and ask God's guidance, making sure that we're on time and growing as um, we're expected to, that we're progressing according to His timeline. And next, it is yours to birth. Genesis 3 and 16 says, I will surely multiply your pain and labor. Listen, labor is tough. There isn't anything glamorous about it. And if someone tells you otherwise, they have had really good medication. Because for the rest of us, it was long and painful. It hurt. Sometimes it was beyond what we felt we could endure. And it takes great effort and determination. But it had to be accomplished. And it had to be accomplished for two reasons. So that it may have life. And so that we, the mother, could become complete. Take a deep breath. Because after birth, you are not finished. Next, it is yours to oversee and nourish. That's right. You have to take it home. Because what God gives to you and entrusts to your care, He expects you to tend to. You're going to have to log some sleepless nights, and you're going to have to adjust your priorities. And you might even have to sacrifice your wants for its needs. Your wallet might even take a little bit of a hit. And men, you are not off the hook here. Genesis 2 and 15 says that God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. So if your plan only involves you, you're going to have to pull double duty. And that's okay because God knows that and he will supply as you go. But if you are a team, pull your weight. You each have a responsibility to nourish and oversee the plans of God equally. Next, it is yours to shape and to mold. Proverbs 22 and 6 says, To train up a child in the way it should go, and when it is old, it will not depart from it. We need to keep the integrity of God's plan, and seeking His direction, we need to guide its development and secure its foundation. And this is a very vulnerable time in the plans of God, because either it will succeed, or it will be thwarted. Next, it is yours to teach and to direct. Once the plans of God are nourished and molded, they need direction, they need knowledge, because without this they'll never fully come into their own. Proverbs 22 and 15 says that folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but discipline will drive it from him. 
And so we need to encourage and rebuke and love, even if we're speaking to ourselves. Every child, every plan needs direction. It needs knowledge. It needs correction. We need to ask for discernment and for wisdom. We need to ask for courage and integrity. And when that comes, and it will, we need to then walk in it. So this is what I want you to remember from your spiritual what to expect when you're expecting is that one, it is yours. Don't neglect it or give it away. God gives us things for us. He doesn't make mistakes. He, he purposefully chooses you and says this is yours. Don't pass it off. If we don't want the things that God gives us and we're unwilling, he will give it to somebody else and, that, and then we have to sit back and watch that come to pass. So if he gives it to you, take it. Next, you are able. He supplies as we go. He does not give to us something and give us every tool that we're going to need and bear us down and make us carry that with us. He says, I'm giving you this, and as you go, everything you need, I'm going to supply as you need it. Just trust me. Next, what you do really does matter because he's trusting you. Your words, your actions, the way you deal with celebration, the way you deal with tragedy, the way you deal with the downtime when we don't feel like we hear from God or when we're lost and we're wondering. All those times matter. He's trusting us to look to Him in faith and to keep going forward. And next, regardless of anyone's opinion or desire or turn, it's ours. It's really hard when God gives us something and we watched our, our friends wait or when we feel completely unworthy because we know where we've been. When God gives it to you, it's for you. Just go with it. There's no arguing with God. He's not going to make a mistake. And lastly, rejoice. Be grateful for everything God gives you. We're not always grateful in every moment. When hard times come, they're just hard. But we can be thankful for the process, for the plan, and ultimately the product because the product will come. Proverbs 23 and 25 says that she that beareth thee shall rejoice. So go ahead and start rejoicing. I don't know where each of you are in your spiritual motherhood, what you're carrying in your womb, but I do know this, that wherever you are, it requires complete and total surrender to God and His will for your life. Maybe you saw yourself in the mothers of the past. I think we can all identify somewhere in there. I know I personally, when I was doing this, thought, that's me, that's me, that's me. Um, maybe you're thinking, listen, I'm ready to explode with the plans of God in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm just right there. Or maybe you're wondering if that seed will ever grow in you. Maybe you're embarrassed because you know your womb's a mess, full of self and rebellion, and it has no room for the plans of God. Or maybe you're just tired and you question God's faith in you and His power in your life to do what He's called you to do. Listen, motherhood is not easy and it is not for the faint or the weak. It demands strength and perseverance. It requires balance and discipline and it will constantly drain you while simultaneously filling you up. It's a crazy ride but it is always worth it. And so I wonder this morning if we could just take a few moments and be encouraged. Um, just close your eyes and listen to the words of this song. Um, our purpose is His purpose. And so whatever He calls me to do, I can do it. And whatever He calls you to do, you can do it. What He's placed in you, He has faith in you to, to see come to pass. This song I play daily. It's on my phone, and those times when I'm bone weary, tired, and I wonder what what God must think of me because I can't see it for myself, and I don't feel like I can keep going. When I look at my children, and I think they need something more. When I feel like walking away, I just let this song kind of wash over me and remind me that I can do anything because He asks me to. Because you asked me to I 
Father, that we just this morning surrender ourselves to you. We surrender ourselves to your plan. Father, our plans are nothing without you, God. Father, I just pray that throughout the day and throughout this week, Father, that as we continue in our journey, as we continue in the plan that you've laid out for us, may we be so ever mindful that you are with us, that you strengthen us, that when times are hard, you are our refuge. Father, that we can just run into you and find all that we have need of. Father, I just thank you. I bless your name. You are a wonderful God. You are a wonderful God. We are blessed abundantly because of your goodness. And we just thank you and we just pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The altars are open. If you're struggling, we're here to pray for you. We've all been in the valleys. But he is with us. He is with us. We hope that you have been ministered to by today's sermon. Our prayer and hope is that you find comfort and encouragement in these words, as well as instruction and correction.